August 16th, 1819. Four years after the Battle of Waterloo. An extraordinary day in the history of Manchester. And you want to know why? Because it didn't bloody rain. Anyone who knows Manchester knows it always rains. And since you need wet weather to turn cotton into thread, that's why Manchester is the capital of the Industrial Revolution. It's where England gets rich. But it's the poorest people that do the work. Men, women and children. All of us serving the looms. We live in the arsehole of the universe, but it shits pure gold. That's why we came together on a baking hot day in August. To hear how we could have a vote. How we could send our own men to Parliament. Men like Henry Hunt. The orator, they called him so full of passion and fire that he could pull the largest crowds ever seen in England, and who knows, trigger a revolution. The magistrates who ran Manchester didn't like it. They liked their mill hands docile. They didn't like to see us organized. To them, it looked like sedition. Maybe if it had rained, we'd have all gone home. But it didn't. We came. And so did the Manchester Yeomanry. Shopkeepers dressed up in uniform on horseback, tradesmen with swords. They came, they said, to arrest Henry Hunt. But some, 20 minutes later, 600 of us were cut to shreds. 600. They called it Peter Lee. Among the dead was a two-year-old child. And how was that explained? Death by falling from his mother's arms, said the coroner. Falling from his mother's arms. The magistrate said it was the fault of the crowd, and that was that. All attempts to find out what really happened, blocked. Ignored in the courts, covered up in the House of Commons. No one's been brought to book. But there was one last chance to find out the truth. There was to be an inquest into the death of one of the crowd, a 22 year old lad who'd fought at the Battle of Waterloo, only to be cut down on St. Peter's Field. Me, John Lees. Grubby little pub in Oldham, just outside Manchester. A strange place for liberty to be on trial. One day a wedding knees up, the next an inquest into a man's death. But James Harmer intended to turn it into a murder inquiry, a national show trial to expose those responsible for a massacre. Here he was, up from London, the son of a Spitalfields weaver, a radical lawyer about to take on the case of a lifetime. He'd seen how the other inquests had been stopped. Harmer was determined to make sure my inquest didn't go the same way. Out of £2,000 raised for the wounded and their families, most got a pound, some got two. Harmer got 500 A fair price to pay if he could really take on the magistrates and their muscle.
Okay, now listen carefully. A coroner's inquest looks like a criminal court, even when it's held in a pub. There's a jury. But the difference is, there's no accused. Well, not officially. But there again, we all knew who was on trial here. The Manchester magistrates, sitting as calm as you like at the back of the room. My father was there with them. Well, he would be. He was a mill owner himself. He refused to have anything to do with armour. No grandstanding southern lawyer was going to wash his family's dirty linen in public. All rise for the coroner. Everything you will hear in this court from now on was really said at the inquest. Except for my words, of course. Dead men don't talk, do they? Has the uh, jury seen the body of the deceased? We have. Very well. I wish it to be distinctly understood that any person wishing to take note on the proceedings is at liberty to do so. But I feel it my duty to prohibit publication of the evidence until after the case is closed. Mr. Harmer, I understand from my clerk that you wish to cross-examine witnesses. Is this um, common practice at inquests in London? I will admit, sir, that I never knew a case in which it was necessary, that at the same time I must inform you that I have been professionally employed to attend inquests on behalf of the coroner of the City of London. And he has permitted me to suggest questions and elicit facts. Very well. Call the first witness. <clears throat> the coroner was Thomas Ferrand, the magistrate's man. He knew what side his bread was buttered. His job was to shut down this inquest. He hadn't even bothered inspecting my body. The first duty of a coroner. What was the point? The thing was all going to be over in a day or two. Or so he thought. What is your name? William Basnett. And your occupation? Surgeon. When did you see the body of John Lees? The day after his death. And can you describe the condition of the body? There was a cut on the right elbow, um, about two inches long and an inch and a half deep. When I bent the elbow, the bone protruded. It, it was almost completely cut in two. Oh, there was uh, what appeared to be a cut or uh, stab on the left shoulder, again, about two inches long. Well, had you not been aware of the circumstances of his death, what would you think produced these injuries? I should have thought by violence inflicted by some instrument. Thank you, Mr. Bassner. Oh, uh, Mr. Harmer. Sir, will you be good enough to inform us what you think was the cause of this man's death? Cutting and maiming. Sir, uh, no more questions. Thank you, Mr. Bassnett. That'll do. We call the next witness. It was easy for Harmer. He didn't come from round here. For the rest of us, testifying took real guts. Many who'd been at Peterloo were terrified. The magistrates were their bosses. They said who worked and who lost their jobs. One snap of their fingers and you lost your poor relief too. William Harrison. We all respected Bill Harrison's commitment to the cause. After all, he had everything to lose. He was a widower with five kids to feed. <laughs> but nothing was going to shut him up. What is your name? William Harrison. Your occupation? Cotton. Spinner. What do you know about the death of John Lees? I saw him 
heading to Manchester on his way to the meeting. The first time I saw him, he was running, and I asked him to wait, but he said, I'll see you at the field. And did you see him there? Yes, sir. By the speaker's platform, just before Mr Hunt came. At first, we were stood right close to each other, but we were separated when the soldiers came up. The Manchester Yeomanry came first, then the 15th Hussars. We had no idea that they would cut us. They gave us no time to get away. Did you see the deceased receive any wound? Yes. I saw him receive a cut on the back of his right arm from a sabre. He was parrying the blows of one of the military and another one came and cut him. He had his right arm up over his head. And were you struck? Yes, sir. They were upon us no sooner than I saw Mr Hunt arrive. I tried to run for my life like a hare from a pack of hounds, but I was pressed against the railings. And then three soldiers came down upon me, one after the other. They was whoosh this way and whoosh that way, pushing and shoving backwards and forwards. Oh, you act as well as speak. Sir! I am no scholar, but I speak the best I can according to truth. So, oh, Mr. Harmer. Did the soldiers not ask you to disperse? They asked me and all those others that they'd struck that day if we would dare come there again, we supposed that they were coming only to arrest the speakers, but they were not content with that. If they had been, then John Lees would not now be dead. Had you or John Lees any intention to break the peace or cause a disturbance or riot on that day? No, sir, not at all. Was there any disturbance or appearance of riot before the military entered? No. It had been very good-humoured and peaceable until the soldiers came in. And if it had not been for them, it would have been one of the nicest sights that ever was seen. John Lees had fought in the Battle of Waterloo. And before he died, he told me that he had never been so scared there as he was at that meeting. For at Waterloo, they had fought man to man. But at Manchester, it was downright murder. That will be all. Well, go about your business. All this talk of swords and maiming was exactly why the magistrates hadn't wanted an inquest. Especially with the crowds swarming round the courtroom day after day. You see, Manchester's a small place. We all knew each other. And we knew who'd done what that day. And here we all were, fessing one another across a makeshift courtroom. It was Peter Lou all over again. Arthur Kearsley. I swear by almighty God that I shall tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. What is your name? Martha Kersley. 
Your occupation? Cotton spinner. What do you know of the death of John Lees? I saw two soldiers striking him, and he was trying to keep them off when another came up and cut him on the shoulder. Are you sure they struck him intending to cut him? I am quite sure. This is the coat he had on. Bring it here. Where did you get this? From his father. Well, how do you know it belonged to the deceased? Why, I saw him in it. Well, I have no doubt of its identity, but wish it to be proved regularly. Um, what became of the deceased after he was uh, cut? Or did he fall down or get away? I cannot tell. Well, that is no answer. You were looking at him. You must have known. No, sir, I don't. I was so... I was so struck with horror that I turned round and saw no more of him. I beg pardon, Mr. Coroner, but I can't help but say that your <laughs> examination of this witness does seem in tone unnecessarily harsh. Well, she has tried my patience. Forgive me, sir, but the usual procedure in inquisitions I have seen has been to let the witness first give their account and then to ask questions if anything remains ambiguous or unstated. But you've cross-examined this witness from the start. I believe I have seen as many inquests as Mr. Harmer and conducted them as well as he has seen them conducted. I beg pardon if I've offended you, sir. I only meant to speak the truth, and I have spoken the truth as far as I can. What? I've seen one of them here. I recognize one of the Manchester Cavalry. Then I demand his name, and I charge him with willful murder. I ask you to take down deliberately, distinctly, what I mean to say, so I shall not be open to any misrepresentation. It is my contention that every member of the Yeomanry Cavalry who entered the field on that day and attacked the people on the 16th of last month without provocation or due cause is guilty of willful murder. And if any person in this room now acted as one of them, then I accuse him of willful murder, and I demand his name. Does anybody know his name? His name? No. His name? Well, may we proceed? His name is William Gregson, sir. And it is my contention that given the evidence already received by this court, you must arrest this man. Mr. Harmer, all these scribblers with you, they appear to be giving you assistance. Uh, no, you're quite mistaken, sir. I have no assistance in this case. These gentlemen are reporters, and I'm entirely unacquainted with them. I insist you arrest this man. I do not feel myself justified in so doing. <laughs> well, I have seen him suggesting questions on a number of occasions. I most distinctly deny that I have any connection whatever with Mr. Harmer. I've not assisted him by suggestions or otherwise. What is your name? My name is Ross. Where have you come from? From London. For what purpose? To give an impartial account of these proceedings to a London newspaper. What paper is it? The Times. <gasps> <gasps> Sir, I cannot help but say that it seems somewhat perverse that a Manchester Yeomanry Cavalry man is protected from giving his name, yet this gentleman here is not only compelled to give his name, but also his business in being here. You must know it is extremely wrong that any publicity should be given to these proceedings, as this is not an open court. I respectfully differ from that opinion, sir. This is, allow me to say, an open court, and therefore its proceedings cannot be kept a secret. Let me through. The Times. They'd never reported from up here before Peterloo. Right, on your way. Harmer knew the jury weren't the only ones with a verdict to reach. Thousands of newspaper readers would be making their minds up too. They even got my father into the papers. His eyes were slowly being opened to how I'd really died. I did not know that my son was going to that meeting. When I got up, I suppose that he was at work at the mill. I didn't see him till the evening. Just a little before dark. 
I examined his clothes. His coat was cut over the shoulder and the elbow. And on the left shoulder, the coat and waistcoat were cut through. And his shirt was cut in many places. And the top of the crown of his hat was off. <laughs> it was a middlingish good hat. Mr. Entwistle. I'm not entirely happy with the manner in which this inquest is proceeding. I won't have it turned into an inquisition. To clear our friend the coroner has met his match in Mr. Homer. We need someone to put out his fire. Ashworth. I found him to be efficient. This is the High Sheriff of all Lancashire, William Hulton. A man who knew a thing or two about efficiency, whether on the factory floor or on St. Peter's Field. A gentleman who told whoever would listen that Peterloo was the proudest day of his life. Good morning, Mr. Harmer. Look who's been sitting at your desk. I understand that, uh, somewhat um, unusually, <laughs> a number of witnesses have already been examined in the course of this inquiry. It is, therefore, of importance that I May state... May I be favoured with your name, please, sir? My name is Ashworth. I'm attending here on behalf of the town of Manchester. And May I have I to request... May I ask requ who employs you on behalf of the town of Manchester? For I will venture to suggest that part of the inhabitants of that town might disavow such a commission. <laughs> <laughs> this letter, which I hand to the coroner, contains my authority. Well, the letter is signed by one of the constables of Manchester and is a sufficient authority for Mr. Ashworth's attendance. Sir, I do not come here today as the advocate of any party, but solely to perform my professional duty. In the first place, to prevent garbled and incomplete statements of the evidence from being published solely for the purpose of exciting a particular impression in the minds of the public. But since I am anxious that the public know the whole case, I should be glad that every particle of evidence which is founded in truth should be heard. But from what I understand, there has not been any specific evidence that any one individual gave a wound which was the cause of the death of this man. So why is your valuable time to be thus occupied? And why is popular opinion to be kept at such a state of ferment as it is at present throughout the country? It is my opinion that this inquiry should terminate. Sir, the... Learned gentleman in his introduction has stated that he appeared before you as an advocate of the town of Manchester. It certainly is a very high sounding appointment. But when asked to show his credentials, we find them dwindling to a mere deputation of one of the constables of Manchester. One of the very parties likely to be implicated in the alleged offence. Your learned gentleman went on to say how anxious he was that this case be fully and fairly investigated. So how does he wish to go about this? Why, by asking you to stop this inquiry and to terminate 
all further investigation. It is my opinion that the question before this court can be limited to that suggested by Mr. Ashworth, namely, whether the precise individuals who struck John Lees can be positively identified. Uh, do you have any witnesses who actually saw the affray? Mr. Coroner, indeed I have. He wished he had. The one thing Harmer didn't have was a witness who could actually nail my murderer. What he would have, if he could persuade a traumatized woman, was a witness who had also been cut by the yeoman. Harmer argued if the cavalry had cut her, it was pretty obvious they could have cut me. He was playing to the gallery and the authorities wouldn't like it. But blood sells papers and may just turn a jury. Speak up. What is your name? Elizabeth Farron. And your occupation? Cotton spinner. Cotton spinner. Do you know anything about the death of John Lees? I do not. Well, then why have you come here? Because I were cut. Where were you cut? On the forehead. I don't mean that woman. I mean, where were you when you were cut? About... About 30 yards from the house where the magistrates were, among the special constables. Were you cut as the cavalry came towards the hustings? Yes, I had with me this child. I was frightened for his safety. So I held him, I held him close to my side with his head held downwards to avoid the blow. I begged him to spare me, child. I don't receive this cut on my forehead. What happened then? I became unconscious. And I remained so for three hours. And when I came to, I found myself in someone's cellar. Did you see anyone cut near the hustings? No. Then I submit that this woman cannot give evidence to this inquest. Oh. 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 Do you know who gave you this wound? Don't answer that. I forbid it. The witness has stated that she was wounded as the cavalry made their way towards the hustings. Now, it is not so very strained a presumption to make that the person who wounded her then went on to the hustings and that he used his sword when he arrived there. Yes. That's right. Aye. Aye. Now, without mentioning the name of the person who wounded you, was that person proceeding towards the hustings at the time. I will not allow her to answer any more questions. The jury have a right to know all the names of the Yeomanry Cavalry on the field that day. I think we would like to know who wounded the witness. I tell you, I will not receive this testimony. Very well. But I shall have it noted that I have tendered it. It may not look like it, but this was a victory for Harmer. His witnesses had done their job. Right! You lot! There'll be no one setting foot in that court again! Go! You've been nothing but underfoot! The, the jury wanted to know more. Get your scum! You backwater scum! Go! The magistrates would have to find their own witnesses. The thing was, the mill owners of Manchester thought themselves the lords of the universe. They controlled the world. Inside the factories, they turned the clocks back at night or forward in the morning 
to spin out the working day. I'll do it. Get in the court to see Peter Lou their way. Well, surely that wouldn't pose them any problems. Somebody just needed to tell the court the official version. That it had been the crowd, not the soldiers, who'd sparked the violence. Well, that was easily arranged. What is your name? Robert. Hall. And what are you, another spinner? No, a salesman. No, oh, what do you sell? Cotton. Were you in St. Peter's Field on the 16th of August? Yes, in an empty house overlooking the field. Did you see anything of the hustings? Uh, yes, I saw Mr. Hunt there. Well, what next? The cavalry then came upon the ground and he put up his hat and said, see, they come in disorder, as if to say they were not like regular soldiers and to put them off with a scoff like. And they gave him these three cheers. And did you see anything else? Well, just that before they moved forward, Mr. Mir, the trumpeter, waved his sword backwards and forwards like this. And there was this man who just stood there I don't know whether he was frightened or not, but he just stood as if in defiance. And then the trumpeter damned him and hit him with his sword. I did not see him bleed, so I think he must have hit him with the flat side. Then did you see the soldiers set off? Yes, they moved forward with the swords drawn, but held still over the shoulders like this. Did they proceed directly to the hustings? Yes, and began to disperse the crowd. In what way? Not by any violence, only by striking with the flat sides of the swords. And I saw some people lying on the ground, but that might have been done by horses. There was nobody cut that I saw. How did they go about clearing the field? Asking them to go about the business. And I saw some bricks and stones thrown, and even a pistol was fired at the Omri, a pistol was fired at John Hume. Well, how long did the military remain on the field? Um, I cannot say. I went away then. I was persuaded by one of the constables to act with them after the meeting was over. But not before. Mr Ashworth. Now, in what manner would you say the people assembled that day? Did they come as people on their way to market or about their ordinary business? On the contrary, they, they came in military order with music and flags. And did you see inscriptions on any of the flags? Yes, I saw a black flag and I think it had liberty or death upon it. And did you that day see a dagger drawn upon anything? Yes, I did, a sort of bloody dagger. Was it upon the black flag? Well. That might have had a kind of dagger on it, but I cannot say whether it was upon that that the bloody dagger was. Now, you say you saw the yeomanry come up on the ground. How did they come? Well, they galloped round the corner and formed in front of Mr Buxton's house. Are you sure they galloped? Well, they came at a kind of a canter or a trotting sort of gallop. And when was it the shouts were? Well, as soon as they came upon the ground, it seemed like they were kind of shouts of defiance. In your estimation, was their conduct intended to irritate the military? Yes. And I saw some stones thrown, but another witness can prove that better than me. <laughs> we're not here from you, sir, what other people can prove. They can very well speak for themselves. Oh, I think we'll adjourn oh. now. <clears throat> I, I didn't know whether you wanted me to say it or not. You really did say that. It was in the inquest transcripts. It was published in the Times. And he really was that bad. Armour could hardly wait. And 
moment, sir, if you please. We have no further use for Mr. Hall. If we lose him, it will be in here in black and white tomorrow morning. I almost feel sorry for Robert Hall. He's made his paymasters a laughing stock and betrayed his own people. Robert. Open the door. Robert. I have no idea how he expected to go back to his old life. Especially as everyone now knew exactly what he was. And as it became clearer and clearer what job this cotton salesman really had. How came these special constables to impress you into their service? Um, I met a constable that I know. He took me along and said I must join them. And I told him that I'd been sworn in as a constable about two years before. But I was not one at that time. And did you go with them then? Yes, I did. Then, Mr Coroner, you must accept that you have been hearing the testimony of a special constable. Sir, do not let the law be misunderstood on that subject. I should like to know what other definition the law gives a special constable other than one who acts as one. How came you to gain admittance to this empty house. I knew the person to whom it belongs. He said that his friends and me could use it on that occasion. Use it? For what purpose? To watch the proceedings? Are you asking me whether I was there as a spy or what? No. No, sir. I didn't ask you whether you were a spy. Your own imagination has furnished that supposition. Yet though you were engaged specifically in viewing the hustings, still you observed no riot or disorder, except what was occasioned by the arrival of the yeomanry. Yes. And they arrived in some disarray. Did you ever see a body of the regular cavalry arrive, some trotting, some cantering, some galloping, all at the same time? Well, you may remember there were many different horses out on that day. No, sir, I remember nothing because I was not there. You will, however, be good enough to answer my question. Well, I, I cannot say positively. The people gave the Manchester Yeomanry three cheers. Uh, yes, I think it was three. And the crowd cheered when the bodies of people arrived from Oldham and Royton and other such places. Yes. Tell us, what is the difference between the cheer that was given to the people of Royton and Oldham and the cheer that went up for the arrival of the Manchester Yeomanry Cavalry? One was a cheer of welcome, the other was a cheer of defiance. Be so good as to demonstrate for the coroner and the jury, this distinction that exists between a cheer of welcome and a cheer of defiance. I don't know that I can properly. Were any of your acquaintances in the Manchester Yeomanry that day? Yes. I will thank you to name them. There were many. I will thank you to name those that you can. I know many by sight. Please give me their names. I cannot recollect all their names. Give me the names of those whose names you know. Really, sir, I must object to this. I do not know what good end it can be leading to to be pointing out particular men in this way. I must have the names of all those that the witness knows. Mr. Mir, the trumpeter. He was there, was he not? Yes. Now tell me, how long did he delay his charge to remonstrate with this unfortunate man that you have spoken of before he struck at him with his sword? 
Well, the man stood still, but whether from stupidity or fear, I don't know. But Mr. Mia told him to go on his way. Then this humane trumpeter, in order to bring him to his senses, damned him and gave him a blow with his sword. Yes. But I did not see any blood drawn. Oh, so you have said. Will you swear, then, that the blow was given with the flat rather than the sharp edge of his sword? I will not swear to either, but I think it was with the flat side. No, you'll not get rid of my question that easily, Mr. Hall. Whether or not any of the yeomanry gave a blow with the flat or the sharp edge of their sword, you cannot positively say. No! What then was Mr. Mere doing with his sword? He did the same with it as the other yeomanry. What do you mean by that? Did he keep it uh, stationary on his shoulder, as you said earlier? The coroner wishes to know whether he kept his sword stationary upon his shoulder. I don't believe any of them did that. No, indeed, sir, nor do I. You say you saw a dagger, a bloody dagger. Yes. Are you sure it was not merely the form of a dagger, painted red, which your imagination has transformed into a bloody dagger? Well, sir, did it draw any blood that day? I did not see any. Did you see any blood on the field? I did not. Take notice. Did not take notice, sir. Are you saying that you did not see any blood on the field that day? I cannot say for definite. Well, perhaps I, who was not there, may bring to your mind some things that you did see. Did you see any hats scattered on the field? Yes. And bonnets, sir? Yes. And any shoes, clogs of men, women, and children? Yes. And any blood, sir? <laughs> you may withdraw, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Holt. There's no record of what happened to Robert Hall after his testimony. I tell you, I wouldn't have wanted to be in his shoes. Then Harmer took us all by surprise. He turned on the coroner, who suddenly found himself in the dock. Uh, Mr. Coroner, I should like to know whether you have seen the body or not. If not, I respectfully suggest that you do so before this inquest is concluded. As I assume you know, it is a material part of your duty. I give no answer. Am I to understand, then, that you have not seen the body of the deceased? I give no answer. I wish you to answer yes or no. I give no answer. Well, of course he hadn't. Why would he bother when the inquest was supposed to be an open and shut case? It was three o'clock in the morning when he came knocking on my door, and I wasn't a pretty sight. If he hadn't known it before, it was bloody clear now. It wasn't the flat side of any sword that had killed me. Shut it up. Even my father could see that.
up and down the country. People from all walks of life joined in the debate. Were the radicals really plotting to take over the country? Mr. Hunt. Mr. Harmer. The eyes of all England. Nay, of all Europe. Are fixed upon you. You've got to remember that everyone was alive to the possibility of a violent revolution. In France, 30 years before, that was exactly what had happened. The magistrates certainly felt their necks could be on the block. Especially after they'd seen Harmer expose their stooge, Robert Hall, as a barefaced liar. Who was that person? <sighs> that testimony was calamitous. We'll have no more of these idiots. No legitimate purpose could have justified that meeting. It was nothing short of insurrection. And that position must be plainly stated by a gentleman of quality. Like Holton's right-hand man, Roger Entwistle. He'd pull this back from the brink, get the spinners back to their looms, and Manchester back to what it was best at, making money. Would you call your next witness, please, Mr. Asperth? The magistrates knew what they were doing when they put Entwistle up against Harmer. He had 30 years' experience as a prosecutor himself and he was ready for a legal sword fight. Could you please tell us your name? Roger Entwistle. And your occupation? Attorney at law. Tell us what you saw on the 16th of August. I saw several thousands marching past the Albion Hotel in Piccadilly towards St. Peter's Field. There were men, women, and children. Some with flags and banners. I believe they'd come from Oldham. Would you continue, Mr. Ashworth? Did the Oldham Company come into town as people coming about their ordinary business? No. They came in military order. And previous to their arriving at St. Peter's Church, the command halt was given. And the band then struck up Royal Britannia, and several cried out, Britons never will be slaves. And were you at the hostings when Mr. Hunt was arrested? No. When I saw the yeomanry approaching, I joined the constables, but not before the soldiers were assailed with stones, bricks and sticks. I saw no danger until then. I then feared some danger might ensue. And previous to that happening, I mean these bricks and stones being thrown, had you seen the yeomanry strike any person among the crowd? I never saw a single blow struck during the whole of the time. That is, not before the bricks and stones were thrown. No. And in your opinion, was it possible to disperse such an immense number of people without some accident or other, however considerately it had been done? In my opinion, it was not. So here we go. This was Harmer's first opportunity to face down a man who knew whether the whole assault had been premeditated. You say, in your opinion, it was not possible to disperse so large a crowd without there being some accident. Let us consider this word, accident. 
do you believe, sir, in your opinion, that it was possible for the Manchester Yeomanry to have ridden into this crowd without killing and injuring people? But the military were assailed. And then I thought there was danger. That's not an answer to my question, Mr. Entwistle. I ask you again whether, in your opinion, it was possible for the Manchester Yeomanry Cavalry to come upon the trot into this crowd without killing and injuring a great many people. They could have escaped. Escaped? How? How could they have escaped? How much time was there between the military coming on the ground and their charging amongst people? I suppose three or four minutes. Three or four minutes. And you believe that so great a multitude could have been dispersed within three or four minutes. Tell me, was there anything that took place within this time to indicate to the people that they were to be dispersed? Well, no. You went to the ground, I think you say, on two separate occasions. I went first at about 10 o'clock, then to the Albion and back again at about one. And you anticipated danger since the people came in military step? Yes, they were marching. And they played Rule Britannia in Moseley Street. And the people joined in the chorus. I would not say they joined in the chorus, but they were exclaiming, Britons never will be slaves. That is the chorus, is it not? It's Britons never shall be slaves. <laughs> and this singing put you in great dread. I had no doubt whatever that the peace of the town would be broken. Yes, indeed, sir, but the question is, by whom? When did these apprehensions of danger first come upon you? As the crowds pass the Albion. Then you will be good enough to tell us why it was that after you had entertained these apprehensions of danger, you proceeded into the midst of this meeting on two separate occasions. You heard my question, Mr. Entwistle. Now, please be good enough to answer it. He is going to answer it, sir, if you will give him time. I have given him plenty of time to answer the question in whichever way he thinks fit. I will repeat my question. How is it, after you entertained these apprehensions of danger, you proceeded immediately into the midst of this meeting? I was with the special constables all the time. I was well aware that there was an understanding between the military and the civil power, that they would not act against the... Um, I mean, they would not act unless there was occasion. Ah. Oh then you knew there was an understanding between the military and the civil power. Who told you of this understanding, this arrangement? You're not to look at this gentleman here, sir, for your instruction. You are to answer my question. I saw the arrangement. I knew that the constables had been summoned to a meeting in the morning. When? Was this arrangement made between the military and the special constables? Well, I knew that the military would be... No, I did not say an arrangement between the military and the civil power. No, the witness never said any such thing. He said there was an understanding. Very well, we shall take it as an understanding, if you please. When did this understanding take place between the military and the special constables? I knew there was an understanding. Upon your oath, sir, who told you there was an understanding? Do not be quite so severe, sir, upon the witness. I am not severe upon the witness. If he hesitates in this manner, I must use every means within my power to extract the truth, and I will not be interrupted in this way. <laughs> Interrupt you, sir. Good God, Mr. Coroner, the gentleman is so sorry should be wrapped in fine cotton. Mr. Entwistle is as respectable a man as Mr. Harmer, and he is not to have these insinuations thrown about that he is not telling the truth. Forgive me. Forgive me. 
perhaps now you will condescend to answer my question. I will repeat it for you. Who told you of this understanding between the military and the civil power? It was my own idea. <laughs> you said just now you knew it. As well as my own idea would tell me. <laughs> Very well. Be so good as to explain to us what it is you mean by the word understanding. I have told you. I said they would not act unless there was occasion. Have you no other explanation to offer? I say it was my own idea that they would not act or interfere with the mob unless there was occasion. Very well. Now, sir, what did you mean by stating that you placed yourself under the protection of the special constables? It was to get out of the way of the Cheshire Yeomanry, who would not be able to distinguish the special constables so well as the Manchester Yeomanry. So all on the field were to be cut to pieces except the special constables? I saw no cutting. So you have said, sir. But will you swear that you did not see a great many wounded persons? I saw several. After the meeting was over. Only one had been cut. That was a special constable. Well, what did you mean then by saying that you did not see anyone cut? He means he did not see the blow given. Uh, no doubt Mr. Entwistle can very well explain for himself what it is he means. What Mr. Ashworth said is what you meant, is it not? Yes, I did not actually see them cut. But they were cut. Very well. I shall ask you no more questions. I think that's enough for today. It might have looked like he'd managed to wriggle off the hook, but he hadn't had it all his own way. The jury could see, plain as day, that Peterloo wasn't just crowd control gone wrong. But the magistrates weren't out of dirty tricks yet. Gentlemen, rumour has it that you intend to move this inquest elsewhere. Uh, oh, Mr. Harmer, won't you join us for a drink? To our better acquaintance. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Harmer, the fact is, I've only been paid for two weeks and this has already gone on for three. The town does not enjoy such turmoil, Mr. Harmer. I do favour a swift conclusion to this. Or well, how? I should like to hear the testimony of Mr. Holton. <laughs> Not a likely contingency. Not in our lifetimes. <laughs> Very well. Onwards, then. This building will be surrounded by a thousand people tomorrow. And the next day. And the day after that. Until we have the men responsible for the death of John Lees. There is one person who could testify. But I wouldn't want to be the one who asks him. Mr. Ashworth. Palmer was right. The crowds got bigger by the day and angrier. It was the magistrate's worst nightmare. This was their town and they were losing it. It was time to deliver a knockout blow. Send in the hard man. Joseph Nadin. He called himself the King of Manchester. He'd once been a spinner like us, but he was working for them now and didn't care who knew it. He'd arrested Henry Hunt, 
It was his job to finish what he'd started and see Harmer off. I swear by almighty God to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And what is your name? Joseph Nadin. And you are the Deputy Constable of Manchester, I believe? I am. Were you on the field by St. Peter's Church on the 16th of August last? I was. Please continue, Mr. Ashworth. Did you receive any warrant on the 16th of August for the arrest of anybody? I did. And by whom was it signed? The High Sheriff of Lancashire, Mr. Holton. And who was it to arrest? The main speaker, Hunt. And what did you say to the magistrates when you received it? I said it was beyond my power to execute the warrant without the assistance of the military. Oh, what made you say that? Because of the large number of people and um, between the constables and Hunt, they were linked together arm in arm and because of the instruments they had in their hands. What were these instruments they had? Well, some of them had sticks and uh, one man had an iron bar that looked as if it had come from some railings. And did you observe whether the yeomanry, in going up to the hostings, struck anybody with their swords? No, they did not. Either with the flat side or with the sharp side? In no way. And I ask you again, was there any possibility of executing the warrant without employing the military? No, it was impossible, even if we had ten times the number of constables. Mr. Harmer. You say nobody was struck by sabres... Uh, uh, before I answer any of your questions, I should like to know your authority. The coroner has authorised me to cross-examine any witness that appears before this court. But I should like to know who employs you. Are you employed by, what, the family or these reformers here? Direct your questions to the coroner, please, sir. Uh, have you, sir, received such a satisfactory explanation for Mr. Harmer's appearing here that you authorise his cross-examining witnesses? No, I certainly have not. He's in my employ. Mr. Harmer, I accept my best thanks for your past exertions on my behalf in this present inquest. I am confident that my son John died as a consequence of this wound he received on the 16th of August last in Manchester. And I rely on you to bring the perpetrators to justice. Robert Lees, father of the deceased. Bloody hell. My father of all people. On my side at last. So, nobody was trampled by horses? I never saw one. Of course not. Nor was a single sword ever uplifted. Not that I saw. Of course not. Nor was anyone either cut or struck. No. Do you mean to say then that none of the Manchester Yeomanry struck or cut at any of the people Upon my soul, I did not see anybody do it. You did not upon your soul, sir, but I ask you upon your oath. Dear me, if this heat continues, I will have to leave. I can't stay here. Would you take a glass of wine, Mr. Nadin? You seem rather unwell. No, thank you. I'd better not. Did you not know, sir, that the Manchester Yeoman Recovery intended to disperse this crowd by the edge of the sword? No. Then you will tell me why, as soon as the Yeomanry made their appearance, you withdrew your constables behind them? To make room for them to come through. Did you not know that it is the duty of the civil authority to precede the military? I should be sorry to precede it in such a case as this. That's not an answer to my question, Mr. Nadin, and you know it. Do you not know that it is the duty of the civil authority to go ahead and execute any warrant there might be before he calls in the military? If he can, but I could not. Did you try? 
I did. Did you not just say that the military went first and then you followed them? Yes. Well, then at what point did you try to execute the warrant? I came down before the military went. Oh, so it was at your suggestion that the military were to come? I, I have said I could not execute the warrant without the assistance of the military. Why? I, have you not just said that you walked up and down the line of constables that ran from the magistrate's house to the hustings on repeated occasions before the arrival of the military? Yes. And did anyone attempt to strike you? No. Mr. Nadin, with the greatest respect, is there anyone more obnoxious to the reformers and in Manchester especially than yourself? I dare say there might not be. Yet you walked up and down the middle of a vast crowd of them without receiving any violence. Thank you, Mr. Nadin. I trust, sir, that you will pause a while for the lower part of the room to be cleared, for it is unbearably hot. Mr. Nadin, would you be so good as to have that part of the room cleared? Is there a constable there? Then clear the room! Mr. Coroner, as this is an open court, I do hope there will not be any violence used against these people. Thank you, Mr. Naden. That will be all. Intention, in the light of the disturbances that this inquiry has occasioned upon the people of this town, and for the inconvenience to the members of the jury, that this inquest should be adjourned to a date six weeks from now. Uh, should you have any objection, I will allow time for an application to be made to the Court of the King's Bench. Mr. Coroner, I beg leave to be heard for one moment. I don't know you, sir. I think you've been heard too much already. In fact, I object to your being heard at all. I am entitled to be heard! I have nothing more to say to you! If you have any objection, you know where to apply for redress. So, they shut us down. Of course, they never reopened my case. Harmer had got so close. But there would be no verdict now. Like most of the losers in history, we would simply disappear. Safely covered up. Manchester especially, than yourself. They say they might not be. Yet you walked up and down in the middle of a vast crowd of them without receiving any violence. Yes.
Constable Naden. Here's the warrant for his arrest. I saw Mr. Hunt there. Our enemies are amongst us today and will seek every opportunity to spill our blood. Did you not know that it is the duty of the civil authority to precede the military? I should be sorry to precede it in such a case as this. And there was this man who just stood there. I don't know whether he was frightened or not, but he just stood as if in defiance. Do have an understanding. I did not see him flee, so I think he must have hit him with the flat side. The Manchester Yeomanry came first, then the 15th Hussars. We supposed that they were coming only to arrest the speakers, but they were not content with that. Are you asking me whether it was there as a spy or what? I begged him to spare me, child, and I received his cut on my forehead. I became unconscious. I never saw a single blow struck during the whole of the time. And what of the death of John Lees? I saw two soldiers striking him, and he was trying to keep them off. He had his right arm up over his head. What do you think was the cause of this man's death? Cutting and maiming. So there you have it, Mr. Harmer. The magistrates kept their jobs. The looms kept spinning. And everyone forgot about me. But thanks to what happened in a back room of the little Oldham pub, they remembered Peter Lou. And revolutions are funny things. Maybe they don't always need to happen overnight with a bang. Sometimes they happen slowly, quietly, the English way. Because over the next hundred years, we did get the vote. First the men, eventually the women. I suppose a land where everyone gets a vote and uses it, mind. Well, that's what we died for at Peterloo.